Heyo, welcome everyone to episode 34 of Today in the Scene. I'm Joe with Indie Arcade Wave, and this week we're going to bring back a good friend of ours, uh, Tony Hauber. We're going to dive deeper into Death Ball and speak to him about his new game uh, that he's working on right now called Renown. How are you doing today, Tony? Doing great. Doing great. Awesome. Yeah, it's it's been a little while since we spoke. Um, I know everybody really liked the Death Ball episode to kind of hear about the game and how it came to be. Um Let's just jump right into it. Um, actually, right before that, I just want to remind everybody, if you like what we're doing here at Indie Arcade Wave, don't forget to subscribe, like, and share. Um, it helps so much just to grow the community and to get more guests on here. Um, so back to you, Tony. Um, can you just introduce yourself again and let us know kind of what you've been up to since the last time we spoke? Yeah, so uh, Tony Halber, I'm doing you know game design uh, for about four years now i guess it's it's probably closer to five and a half and i started uh kind of with a public launch of death ball which is a platforming wizard soccer game for anybody out there who's not familiar with it and it's arcade exclusive so you can only play it in the arcades uh and since then i've been kind of working on some new stuff that uh Hopefully we'll get to talk a little bit more about today, kind of more open world MMORPG kind of stuff. Awesome. I'm really excited to talk about that um, because I've been keeping up with it little by little and you keep giving us little teasers every couple weeks. Um, For the people that are not aware of Death Ball or haven't heard the older episode, um, can you just give a quick rundown, like a quick review on how you created Death Ball and kind of what the game is about and how it's played? Yeah, so Death Ball, I guess I guess the best way to describe it is to talk about the two games that I was playing most when I developed it, and that was Killer Queen and Rocket League. And so Death Ball is kind of a platforming 2D arcade version of Rocket League with with like some more influence of this Killer Queen by being a one button, one joystick game. So the idea is you're a wizard, you're on this map. There's the death ball, which is, you know, you can, you can call it like a soccer ball kind of thing. And, and you're trying to get this death ball that into your goal or to touch your power well. And if you do that, it shoots a beam out that attacks your enemy. And if you, if you can do that three times, then your enemy dies and you win. And, uh, re- you know, really it's, it's a really simplistic game. You have a joystick and a button. And my goal was just to pack as many different mechanics into that system as I could. So while you only have those two things, you have up to five different ways you can kind of interact with the ball. Yeah, I mean, the game the game is a blast. It, it does have that Rocket League feel. I can totally understand that. Um, and Killer Queen too, I mean, with the, the kind of retro look to it, but also um, the arcade vibe and the player versus player, the community that builds around that. Um, speaking of the community with that, I'm wondering what tricks have you learned from the player base since you put Death Ball out in arcades? Like what little nooks in the code did they find that you didn't really kind of put together with that that system of just one button having so many different abilities? Yeah, well, uh, you know, I kind of I kind of think of it as with the system that exists there's, you know, the, the five ways that I talk about to interact with the ball where you can slide across the ground or you can lift the ball off the ground or you can make a bubble in the air, which will kind of stick around. That bubble will stick around. It's kind of like a pinball bumper. Uh, and you kind of, the thing is people have started to compose these in really interesting ways. And like you slide under the ball and then you pop up, you lift the ball up and then you drop a, a, bubble right there and like that little move is a good way to like regain position on the ball to turn it around and take it back towards your goal and and I just kind of have started to see people do all kinds of interesting things with it and uh, the the reality is too there they start to tech it in ways that I didn't even you know I didn't even I'm not even they start to learn more about the way that the mechanics work than you do as a player. And at one point there was this bug where uh, one side, if they try to do a diagonal down jump, uh, this certain thing would, uh, this certain uh, like angle would occur 
and it wouldn't occur any other way. And that was like a bug in the code that I would never have perceived, but just because they were so trying to become so precise with the angles they take on their shots and stuff, they kind of discovered this and they shot a video of it and sent it to me. And yeah, it's, it is, and it's, it's like when I see somebody who can play like that, it's just like the game is just kind of electric. It just, you never anticipated people becoming as good as they they are with it. The, the ability to pinch the ball with such precision or the ability to place a hard bubble in such a way that it, it creates such a obstacle for other players. And uh, I mean, I'm really happy with it, but it's kind of, you know, I guess that's the goal is you want people to be able to surprise you with the mechanics that you've given to them. So. Yeah, I mean, you kind of laid it out. You gave them all these different Lego pieces. And when you were testing it and designing it, you were like, okay, these should fit kind of like this. Like they should follow the instructions. And then the people get their hands on the game. And all of a sudden they're like, no, this one could go here and it'll work better and I'll have more control. Yeah, um, I've always found that so cool with games. I mean, even like you look at uh, speedrunners and they find these glitches yeah. in the wall and they finish a game that has 30 hours of gameplay in an hour. Like it's just, it's wild how people can do this. It kind of, um, it kind of reminds me of this time when I took the game to Minneapolis. Uh, this is before they had a, a cab up there or actually this is the, we, the day that we took the cab up there and we had a little tournament for it. And in one of the maps, there was this, uh, collider, they, the, the colliders for the wall weren't quite overlapping. So there was this perfect ball sized hole in there. And it was really rare, uh, but like people discovered it and we, you know, people started cheering secret tunnel because it would go and like wrap around the map and then come out the other side. And uh, it's just, you know, it's kind of funny how these things, they kind of pass the scrutiny of play testers and stuff and they kind of get out there and people become really attached to them because they discovered them and they're kind of special. Right. It's in your eyes, it's something that you, you missed, but then they make it special and you're like, okay, well, let's leave that. It's kind of what happened with uh, us on Galactic Battleground when you get sucked into a black hole and you have laser. The laser actually leaves the ship and just wipes everybody out on the on the yeah. screen, yeah. which we thought was absolutely hilarious. We we're like, let's just leave it. Like, yeah. that's fun. Um, well, in a classic example uh, for anybody who's kind of following the modern arcade stuff is in Killer Queen, you know, they, they never... Uh, intended to have the hover state where you're stuck to the top of this platform in a perfect position it's a, it's a joust like game so if you're if if you're hovering they call it where your your head is stuck to the ceiling because you're tapping so fast you're pretty much unkillable and that's become the cornerstone for a lot of the ways that teams have developed play and that was just i mean it was kind of a bug it was they they didn't want you to bounce off of the platform when you were under a certain momentum so they kind of had this state that kind of made you stuck to the ceiling. Yeah, it became a, a safe space for the, the queen to kind of play strategically and wait for the right moment to attack. Mm -hmm. um, speaking of the mechanics that you had, um, saying that you have the, the five different actions for the single button, uh, what was the most difficult mechanic for you to code and why did you have trouble with that? Uh, that's a good question. <clears throat> I guess the most difficult one was probably the hard bubble. And okay. it presented a problem because it's because of, you know, you're, you're building in a physics engine. Um, and then the hard bubble kind of breaks a lot of the rules of the physics of the way the bubble had worked. So, like, you make this bubble, which uh, is not a solid object. It's, you know, it's a... It, they call it a trigger in Unity, but it's it's a non-solid object. Uh, and then after a certain period of time, it becomes a solid object. And you have to make sure that other players, like certain players can't pass through it, and other players can. And you have to make sure that the ball reacts to it in a way that, uh, you know, if the, ball is in, if the ball were inside of it when it became hard, what happens then? And that one was kind of challenging, but... You know, all of these things, you know, when I look back now, it doesn't feel challenging. All of these things are, are a challenge when you're trying to push yourself to 
conceptualize how this should work. But then after the fact, it seems kind of obvious. And I think that's kind of, you know, a sign of a good mechanic is when you've come to the understanding of how something should work. And so, uh, and then, you know, there are some other hard ones, just like getting the, getting it to be the perfect number. A lot of times, you know, in unity, you can set a public variable. So set the velocity that you want the, or the force that you want a bubble to have and stuff. And then I would just play with it for, you know, an hour and a half. Okay. What about, what about 1.72? Hmm. That's a little too high. What about 1.68? No, that's, well, that's a little too low. Like maybe 1.69. And you start to actually like the numbers get, they get, you can get really precise with it, but you, you kind of have to have an understanding of what you're trying to make it do and then try to make the numbers fit that. Um, but honestly, you end up using a lot more vector physics than I ever thought I'd use in my life. Uh, and so if you're out there and you're studying physics and you're learning vector physics and you're like, I don't know when I'm ever going to utilize this. Well, maybe building a arcade sports game. Yeah. When you're, you're dealing with all the stuff that you got going on in death ball. And I, I think that's, that's really cool. It's interesting how you're talking about, like, it's not a solid object until it becomes a solid object. And then some people can pass through it. I mean, you're basically building a wall but you individually can move through it. And it, it is, does sound like it could be a really complex mechanic to put together. I don't code, so it sounds like a headache to me. But um, were there any mechanics that you were kind of wanted to put in the game and you ended up not going with them? Oh, yeah. I had this idea called the air grapple. Uh, and the idea there was... So, you know, the controls are really overloaded for anybody who hasn't played. Uh, there. And it's all kind of based on this concept of, of trying to make everything do two or three things. So, you know, this button is overloaded with context and with combinations with the joystick. So you hold down and press jump while you're on the ground. Well, that's a slide. You hold down and press jump while you're in the air. Well, that's a down bubble. You, uh, uh, you know, you, you hold the bubble you, you jump and then you jump again to make a bubble and you hold it and that becomes a hard bubble. So they're kind of overloaded by all this context. And one of the things I was like, I don't use up at all. So what if I used up for something? What would up, what would up and jump, what would up and bubbling actually be? And so I kind of built this idea of a air grapple where you would kind of, uh, if you jumped up in, in a, in up directly or in a diagonal and up direction, you would kind of, if the, if the ball was in a certain sphere of you, you'd kind of pull it with you. So you could kind of like have a way to pull the ball out of the goal if you jumped a certain way. And I toyed around with that. And I'm not, I'm, I mean, I'm not completely done with that. Uh, but in my experiments, you know, it just ended up feeling like the whole thing was a little too overloaded. Like I, I was accidentally utilizing this and, and then you have to think about the brand new player because everything to the brand new player has to flow outward normally. You don't want them to accidentally do something and, or, or feel so uncomfortable with the game that they don't know how they're making all this stuff happen. And the air grapple, it's just too common for people to hold up and jump and it was doing something different now. And it was really hard for people to kind of understand that concept. And so I'm not completely done with it. Uh, I, oh, you know, and there's another one that I really love. Uh, and that was the, before the slide, there was this problem where the ball is moving away from you towards your goal and you're on the far side of it. So you're running towards it, right? And if you get next to it and jump, well, that's called a lift. If you jump next to the ball, you lift the ball up in the air. So that's not a good way to get around it, to turn it back. And, and so you'd have, to, you'd have to run at it, jump early, and then jump down, and you could kind of turn around and come back at it. But I wanted there to be a quick way that you could turn the ball. So I made this thing where if you change direction when you were right next to the ball, it would kind of like warp it around you to the other side. Uh, and we, we toyed around with that and actually that was in the game for a long time. I don't know if many people got to play it when it was in that state, but that was in the game for 
a long time before we eventually decided to drop it. It's just too buggy, and it just uh, also at times too powerful, and it just created kind of this ability for somebody to kind of hold on to the ball and kind of have a little too much control over, over, uh, you know, not it's more defensive, not aggressive action. So felt too much like a get out of jail free card. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I can, I can definitely relate with the idea of like, it's just, uh, the player accidentally using a function that you implement in the game. I mean, we did that with GBG, uh, where, we did like a, you'd go down and then to the right or to the left and kind of make like a swooping motion with the joystick. And that would give you a dash where you could mm-hmm. um, just like a burst of speed. And we even found ourselves accidentally using it all the time. So we took it out and instead just gave the player the ability to move up and down. Like yeah. just, there's a little bit more room there. Cause we were having so many people run, like get stuck and you couldn't dodge debris. So we were like, let's just give you the ability to go up and over it. Yeah. And that's, um, a, that's exactly like the point is you, you're trying to often with mechanics, you're just trying to solve problems in the game. And so sometimes you do get down the rabbit hole too far of this is the solution. And, and with that warp thing, it turned out when you slide now, which was a mechanic that was added later, the down and jump when you're on the ground, you do a really fast slide across the ground. And if you slide towards the ball, it will actually kick the ball like almost directly up in the air. So that's kind of how you get under it and around it now. Right. I like, I like the, I like the slide a lot. It, it is very, very useful and it's kind of my go-to move. Um, I'm awful at death ball, but I have so much fun playing it. Um, you kind of spoke about how that grappling idea is still kind of in the back of your mind for potentially adding it later. Are there any other mechanics that you were thinking about adding to the game or any different game modes or way to play the game? Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, I will never stop adding game modes to it. I think I I like, like we have power ups now, which is just it's. I I like to hide these things away so they never harm normal gameplay. But if people find out about them, they're a fun way that they can kind of play the game differently. Like right now, on every cab out there, if you hold up on both joysticks, it will activate power ups, which are the wind power up and the golden bubble power up. And and I don't want to. I mean, we can dive deeper into that if we want, but uh, I don't want to get uh, too off track with the question here. Uh, I have thought a lot about new ways to have mechanics. Like one of the things that is heavy on my mind is, you know, we have a bubble wizard. It's a type of wizard. It's just like when Street Fighter came out, it was Ken versus Ken, right? So what if the next version of Death Ball or maybe even this version with with new updates introduces a new type of wizard? What would that even look like? You know, and I've, I've thought a lot about that. I have ideas. I've started to implement some of them and then, you know, had other pressing things to do. But, uh, but yeah, I think a lot about that <clears throat> or what would death ball two look like, right? Right. How, how could you keep the same game at the core, but make it a little bit different? I mean, you like, like the men you brought up street fighter. I mean, how many versions of street fighter now are there? And mm-hmm. you were talking about just being Ken versus Ken. Now there's, I mean, I think in, in street fighter five, there's like, 20 or 30 characters so it's just how do you keep the same base to to appeal to the same people but also keep it fresh and uh there's like a game design concept that i think about a lot and that's what i call that when you like add new characters or or you basically branch the options by like building whole new other things i like to call that content depth which is like i'm going to add depth to the game by just adding more of these like choices that you can get that are like new new rules. I've just added new rules to it. Where I like to think of the thing that I really want to strive for generally is mechanical depth, where it's like I'm not adding more rules. I am adding rules that make all the choices more interesting. So every time I add a rule, all your 10 choices you had before, well, they're all branched now because they have this new way they can be composed with this new rule. So instead of making 10 more 10 more levels of depths by adding 10 characters, you know, I added one thing that interacted with all these things and and made that depth. So that's something I think about a lot too. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's the biggest thing. That's how you, you make the game like playing the same. I mean, you have a handful of levels, so you play the game over and over with the same concept of every match, but they're all different. You never play the same match twice. Yep. So, um, 
I was going to ask what the future plans were for Death Ball, but I'm kind of interested in these power-ups now because I just saw a little teaser and I haven't been able to play them. What are the power-ups and how do they function different than all the original abilities? Well, yeah, the idea of the power-up uh, was just like a, a way to make a game feel a little more casual. Uh, one of the ways that I really test this game is we had, before pre-pandemic, we had a league night and every Thursday night, anywhere between four to eight of us would come together and play the game. And I would always try to time my, you know, new additions to be able to test them that night and get a feel of how they worked in kind of a group of people that were good at playing the game. Uh, and so one of the things I noticed is the games got really competitive and that's fine. I really do. I enjoy that. But I also was like, you know, sometimes we just want to be a little less competitive. So I designed this mode that had power ups and then it was also a chance for me to, experiment in a way that doesn't impact the regular game, new mechanics that we can kind of try out. And so uh, the two power-ups that exist right now are the gold bubble and the wind power-up. And uh, the gold bubble is is not that new of a concept. Uh, it's really just the way the, these bubbles exist on the map and uh, the, you just run over them or you you touch them and you get the power up. And then all of them work the way that when you have the power up, your next bubble that you would do instead does the power up. So uh, the gold bubble works like this. You, When you get it, your next bubble you drop is a gold bubble, which is essentially just a hard bubble. And it will stay there no matter how many other bubbles you place. So you kind of get to put this set piece out there. That's You, you kind of get to like make a new platform in the world that will stay out there for eight seconds. And you can do all kinds of stuff with that that's fun. You can trap your opponent into a difficult position for them to, now they have to move around these platforms and they're out of position. You can cover your goal up. And with the gold power up, I think it's set to right now, it's your next two bubbles drop gold uh, bubbles. Uh, and they both stick around. So you can, you can you know, take up a lot of space with that. But the other one, the wind power up, that one I really find interesting. And I, I think about it a lot as potentially a new type of wizard, the wind wizard. Uh, and it's really powerful right now, so clearly it wouldn't work exactly like this. But when you get the wind power up, anywhere you are on the map, any whatever when you're going to make your next bubble, whatever direction you're holding, you press it, and all these like particles fly across the screen in that direction, and it'll essentially kick the ball in whatever direction you're holding. So you can jump up, kick the ball completely across the map, doesn't have to be on goal, but uh, you go up, you get this wind power up, the ball bounces up in front of the goal, and then you hold to the, you know, you hold towards the goal and you press jump. You're nowhere near the ball, but the wind sweeps across the stage and knocks the ball into the goal. And it's a really fun, I mean, you know, it's very casual and pe and it's not balanced. Like it's probably appears too often and sometimes people camp the wind and, uh, but it is fun. It is interesting. It definitely adds like a, a new way to think about the composition of the way that you do your moves and the direct the way you move through the map. Right. I mean, it, it builds a completely different dynamic to the game. I know when I play, I usually play um, offensive because my defense is garbage. So if you want to change it up, you could play more defensively, wait for that power up, and then you're the strongest offensive player on, on the on the screen at that point. Yep. And it's and it also even affects that dynamic where sometimes you're trying to corner the person in because they're, they have to be at their goal, and, and the wind power-ups generally in the middle of the map. So then, you know, they're in their goal, you're kind of putting pressure on them, and the wind power-up comes up, and now you leave to go get the wind power-up because it's really powerful. This kind of creates this interesting opportunity where now I, even though you have the wind, I got out of this defensive position, I can move to offense. Or I can do something where I'm on defense, and I do some move to buy me a little bit of time and I go get the wind power up. And then like you have a, a lot of trouble scoring. Cause even if you kick it right into the goal, I, with one, you know, tap of the button, push it out of the goal and towards me. And now I'm kind of free to, I'm kind of have a advantage on the ball and, and it kind of sticks, you get it and it'll stick. You can still jump on the ground, right? The ground is a, when you jump on the ground, that's a lift that doesn't en enact your, your power up so you can also grab it and hold on to it and just be very conservative with your jump where you're kind of hanging out on the ground. 
And that kind of pressure, you know, kind of spooks people because if they get beat just a little bit, well, you have now have the advantage on the ball and the wind, and that's a really powerful combination. Yeah, I mean, that that sounds like it adds a ton to the game. And I, I do really like the idea of having like that, that passcode that gets you into that mode. So it's more of a, a test mode. Yep. Um, yeah, I mean, Death Ball's fun. And I think we've talked about it a lot. I really want to talk about Renown because... Absolutely. This is this is something that I don't really know anything about either, um, because you have been you've been sharing it, but you have been relatively secretive about exactly how everything is going. And I know your mind keeps kind of changing as you work on it. There's some things you like, some things you dislike. Give us a rundown of what your current idea of what renown should look like. Well, yeah, I guess it starts more with a purpose. And my purpose is to try to build an online world where there doesn't need to be NPCs, where you, the value of that you get out of the game, whether it's the excitement of the competitiveness of the arcade nature of it, or whether it's, you know, figuring out the best way to uh, sell something or build something, or, you know, you get the value out of that. And that creates enough of the society to make the world function. And so like I want to build an MMO that doesn't have NPCs, but still feels like a full world. And I'm not the first person to set out to do that, but that's kind of the grand purpose. And, you know, to do that with one person design team, you have to be extremely efficient in the way you're kind of tackling the big problems of, of how do you deal with the open world? Interesting. That is, that is definitely a lot to unwrap. And I think that is a really cool concept. Um, give us a feel for like what the game looks like, how the game plays. Um, what's the environment like? Well, yeah, right now, the, right now, the big thing when we're talking about efficiency is I want an open world, but I want it to be procedurally generated so that it's infinite because I can't, go out and design a whole world that will fit everybody that is going to play into it. I need to design rules about a world that will expand. And right now uh, there are, right now there is a procedural generation process that builds. It's a, it's a flat world, 2d top down. And every tile in that world uh, is built via three different um, Perlin noise maps that decide how hot or cold is this tile, how dry or precipitous is this tile, and what's the general elevation of this tile. Even though the game doesn't have elevation, you know, I think of like a mountain has high elevation, so you're on a mountain tile, versus if you were at low elevation, you'd be in a plain tile. And that goes on to generate kind of the whole world. Um, and that, and that is what, that is all built right now. And that's working And there. You know, we kind of like, I define a mountain tile. Well, if, if you have three maps and they range from zero, zero to one, let's say, you know, anybody who understands binary will see that you have eight different tiles, eight different extremes that kind of, uh, are formed from this because, or, you know, another way I like to visualize it is a cube. You know, at the at one point at the bottom, you know, leftist closest point is zero 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 for all those maps, and at the farthest uh, rightest highest point is one one one, and in that cube you can break it into break that cube into four eight different sections that all represent different biomes. They're called, and that's like a that dictates essentially what kind of terrain can exist in that space. And it's all, I've generated all the art. I don't think it's final art. It's kind of fun to build it and think about it, but it's also like, I'm certainly don't think I'm a pixel artist expert. So, but it's, you know, there's a lava world, there's a jungle world, there's a swamp world, plains world, uh, a, a canyon, a Mesa Canyon world and a, and a, Crag mountain world or, or biome, I should say is probably the better term. So. Gotcha. So 
with the rate that you're at right now, when I know this is such a hard thing to answer for anybody developing a game, but at this point, like where do you see yourself starting to have like an alpha to to test? Um, if I'm right on everything that I think about the game, which is not possible, by the way, I'm just I, I'm just trying to put it in terms that I think will make it make everybody understand. I would say, and I'm working at the kind of rate that I'm working. I would say that in three months, I could have something that's playable that gives you a sense of what I'm trying to accomplish. The problem is I'm wrong a lot, and so I'll build stuff, and when that doesn't work, or it's not fun, or it's not you know, I kind of think a game design is also often forcing interesting choices on on players. Like that's a that's a very that's the way that I think makes a game fun is you're 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 getting these interesting choices at a certain rate. Uh, and if it doesn't accomplish those things, well, then I have to sit down and I have to kind of rework it and rethink about it. So three months is so that's a way of me saying three months could be the earliest that I could I could ever release something. It wouldn't it wouldn't be earlier than that. And it very likely will be later than that. Gotcha. And with my understanding, this is not going to be an arcade game, right? This is going to be more focused as like a Steam, maybe console game? Yep. Well, I have I have definitely toyed around with the idea of having a world that the only way that you can get into it is by being at an arcade machine. And I think that's kind of cool. Uh, like kind of like a... Uh, the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, you know, you have to find this wardrobe to be part of this world. The problem is you run into a lot of issues with player liquidity, and now, like, you know, if you make a... If if I was the best game designer in the world and I could somehow fix all the shortcomings of not having other people in the world all the time, maybe that could be interesting. But the problem is I'm just not... I'm not that great of a game designer. I'm I'm fairly new to it uh, in general, and so I decided that it would just be easier and it would help me get closer to the purpose that I'm trying to do if I kind of dropped that requirement and made it a a console based game. So that's kind of where it's at now. It will it will be released for uh, consoles and PC. I'll probably build an arcade cabinet that you can go and play on um, and it can connect you to the world. Uh, I don't know how that would work economically. You know, there's always the arcade economics. How does it, how does quarter drop into the machine? But uh, yeah, I think, I think that would be a fun thing to do because I love arcade so much and I love being able to play on a stage where other people are watching and you're kind of sharing this one machine, but it won't be exclusive. I don't think. Gotcha. Yeah, I mean, that'd be a really, really cool concept, um, especially for showcasing at conventions and stuff, um, just alongside Death Ball. I mean, if you're already going with Death Ball, why not show off Renown too? Um, I just want you to give shout outs and social media links here before we wrap everything up so that people know where to find you and where they could potentially keep up with Renown in the future. Yeah, absolutely. So I guess if you want to keep up with Renown right now, there, there's not a uh, a Facebook page to it yet. Uh, but if you find me, Tony Halber on Facebook, feel free to follow me or add me. I, I don't have any problem with strangers and I share a lot of my work through that. Uh, or if you really want like a more official version, the death ball arcade, uh, Facebook page, you know, I will, I will eventually cross promote the renowned page when it's available. And, uh, that's also, if you're, if you liked anything about Death Ball, that's where you can find out the most up-to-date information on it. And uh, there's also, we, you know, we have Instagram, uh, which we post to almost as frequently as Facebook. And we have a Twitter, but the Twitter has, you know, not, it's kind of like uh, fallen through the cracks, if you will, as far as being promoted on. So, so I would say the best place is probably the Facebook Death Ball page. Perfect. Well, I'll throw all those links in the description here so that everybody can find them if you're looking for them. Um, again, thank you, Tony, for coming on. It was awesome to talk about Renown as well as diving deeper into Death Ball, not just what's on the surface and how the game is played, but what's actually making it tick and what you're working with on that. For anybody that's listening to the show, wherever you're listening, 
Um, please subscribe, share, like, whatever you want to do, any way that you want to support the show if you enjoy what we're doing here. Uh, we're back every Friday with a new episode with a different developer, arcade owner, uh, or whatever it may be in the scene. Uh, but until next time, peace. Peace.